Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new to my channel, please click the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos that I post in the future. Also, realize that my videos build on each other, so I highly recommend that you check out my previous videos. I'll leave a link to my channel in the area below. Alright, so as you can see, the name of this video is Dark Skinned Europeans, aka Black Men. Okay, so let's get into it. As the video title suggests, I'm going to be showing you some irrefutable evidence that black and brown men were native to Europe. In past videos, I've shown you many individuals native to Europe that have had all of the complexions associated with the term swarthy or dark complexion. Those complexions encompass the colors seguine, tawny, ruddy, light brown, brown, olive, dark brown, and black. All right, so as a side note, we all know someone that may look like the color black to the naked eye, but in actuality, they are just very dark brown. All right, so moving on. Sometimes the word sandy will be used to describe someone's complexion. In my opinion, it would also fall under the term swarthy because let's be real. If you have any melanin beyond the complexions of florid, pale, fair, or fresh, you are someone that comes from a parent with some amount of visible melanin. As I do in all my videos, I will comment on the word complexion. This word is key to understanding what a person's skin looks like. According to Webster's 1828 dictionary, complexion means the color of skin, particularly of the face, the color of the external parts of the body or thing, as a fair complexion, a dark complexion, the complexion of the sky. And honestly, it doesn't matter how far you go back in history or what dictionary you're referencing, the word complexion has not changed. So I know for some of you that have seen my previous videos, I know I'm being somewhat redundant here, but I truly believe that I need to drive home this fact. Unfortunately, there are many people in denial as to what complexion means. This is because they are indoctrinated into believing that only white-skinned people are native to Europe. Even though they read the words that directly contradict their assumptions, they can't wrap their heads around it. I believe it's because once they acknowledge the truth, they will also come to realize who created the European languages, arts, customs, and traditions. But I'll leave that for another video. As I always say, white supremacy has done a number on all of us. I would dare to say worldwide. Anyway, let's take a look at my first piece of evidence. And it comes from the Dublin Gazette newspaper dated November 19th in the year 1706 from page two. Also, I'd like to mention that all of the articles I'll be referencing come from newspaperarchive.com, and that's an online resource that contains historical newspapers from around the world, dating back to the late 1600s. All right, so what I'm gonna do is read the article, and then I will go through and touch on the, uh, the points that I think are important. And you know, as I do in uh, most of my videos, I'm gonna go ahead and apologize ahead of time for any mispronunciation of any words or names. All right, so this little article goes on to read, deserted out of Lieutenant Colonel Wallace's company, belonging to Sir Roger Bradside's regiment, one Duncan McCullum, about six foot high, with a brownish coat and white stockings, speaks no English, and Neil White, a little black man with short hair, about five foot, six inches high, speak but little English, both Scotch men. All right, so I'm gonna stop right there because I've reached the point that I thought was important for me to highlight. Okay, so the obvious point here is that all of these men have deserted their uh, military regiment. I'd really like you to pay attention to where these men were born. And not only that, understand they are recruited or pressed into service as soldiers from the larger population. As in most countries, generally, the military tends to be a microcosm or sample of the larger society. As I mentioned in my video regarding European names, these people's names are not AKA white names given to them by slave masters. In my research, that only occurred when Aboriginal Americans were given or gave themselves European names via Christianization. All right, so back to the article, you can see that uh, Neil White is a little black man with short hair, about five, six, 
and he speaks but little English. And it says both are Scotch men. Both he and Duncan McCullum are Scotch men, meaning they were from Scotland. All right, so we're going to move on to my next piece of evidence, and that comes from the London Post, dated May 26th from the year 1702, and that comes from page two. And as you can see from the article I have there on the screen, it goes on to read, Deserted out of Captain S. de Helm's company in the Honorable Colonel Henry Holt's Regiment of Marines, THO period, now that's the abbreviation for Thomas, so it goes on to say, Thomas Cook, a dark brown man, well set, wears his own hair, a tinker by trade. Born in Waddleton in Oxfordshire, about 26 years of age, wears a copper colored coat. Richard Hanton, a very black man, thin faced, black hair, born in Norton in Hampshire, about five foot seven inches high, wears a dark colored coat, about 25 years of age. J.O., which is probably an abbreviation for Joe or John, Chesman, a black, lusty man, smooth-faced, black hair, wears commonly a light-colored coat with a broad belt, 32 years old, born in Abinger in Surrey. They went away from Salisbury the 20th instant, having everyone a wife with him. Will Finch, a well-set man, about five foot six inches high, of a dark complexion, black curled hair, about 25 years of age, born in London, and used to work about St. Giles in the fields. J.O. Brody, again, it's probably, J.O. is probably abbreviation for Joe or John, of a brown complexion, pock frecken, middle stature, a Scotch man, speaks broad, Carries knives, scissors, and combs, full mouthed, wears sometimes a brown wig. Whoever secures them, or any of them, shall receive two Guinness reward for every one of them from Lieutenant Richards at the Marine Coffee House in Piccadilly, or from the commanding officer of the said company in Salisbury. All right, so you can see here that there are quite a few men of color in this article. And again, they are all uh, deserters from the military and in this case from a regiment of British Marines. We can see the first soldier there, uh, Thomas Cook. He was a dark brown man. So his uh, complexion is pretty self-explanatory. He's also listed there as a tinker by trade, born in the town of Waddleton in the uh, county of Oxfordshire. So after him is Richard Hanton. And of course, it says he's a very black man, so no ambiguity there. And he was born in the town of Norton in the county of Hampshire. So after him, we have J.O. Chesman, um, a black lusty man. And uh, just to define the term lusty, it means uh, basically strong and energetic. And that I'm getting that from the vocabulary.com website. And he was born in Abinger in the county of Surrey. All right, so the next uh, soldier is Will Finch. And he is listed with having a dark complexion with black curled hair. And he was born in London. All right. Um, then after him is uh, J.O. Brody. And he is a, of a brown complexion. And he is a Scotch man. And as we said before, that means he's from Scotland. And it also says that he speaks the Brode. And that means he's got a very heavy Scottish accent or a country Scottish accent. All right, so that is the last soldier in this article that I wanted to cover. And uh, of course, these are all men of color, AKA black men. And of course, uh, obviously there are two in that article that actually say they're black men, but the other ones that uh, list the men as uh, having a dark complexion, a brown complexion. Okay, now we can actually realize that there are black men <laughs> in these countries at these times. So let's stop all the denials, all right? All right, so let's move on to my next piece of evidence. And before I get to it, I just want you to realize that the few examples I'm giving you speaks to a much larger population of black men. These are just a few of the military deserters. Of course, I could not list them all. There were hundreds. But what this does reveal, as in any country's military, the number that honorably served is a thousand times greater. Lastly, on this point, 
I found hundreds of pale and fair complexion deserters as well, although they are not what I'm emphasizing or focusing on in this video. All right, so let's get to my third piece of evidence, and this comes from the London Gazette dated March 17th in the year 1706, page two. All right, and it goes on to read, deserted in London, the 12th instant from Captain Thomas. It looks like Hecker of the regiment of foot commanded by the Honorable Colonel Francis Godfrey. Richard Baxardall, born in Croston in, what is that, Lanshire, a lusty black man, blank hair, six foot high, his clothes very dark gray, aged 25 years. And then we have Richard Chaddock, a black man, five foot seven inches high, his hair curled, born in Ransford in Lanshire, his clothes the same as Baxendall's, aged 30 years. Deserted likewise from the said captain from Wigan in Lant Lanshire, about the 26th of February last. Next, we have William Day, born in Strandeth, maybe? You know, I'm just going to leave it there because the rest of the article does not pertain to what I, I'm trying to point out to you, so. All right, so let's take a deeper look at this article. Again, these two men, these two soldiers have uh, deserted their uh, regiment. All right, so the first one there, Richard Baxendall, was born in Croston and Lanshire. And again, they called him a lusty black man with lank hair. So not curly hair, but lank hair. And this is obvious, you know, not all black men have uh, curly hair. And just for your information, uh, Lancashire is in um, Northwest England. All right, so let's move on to the second soldier and that's Richard Chaddock. And again, they list him as a black man and he has curled hair and he was born in Ransford in Lancashire County. So generally the same area. And again, I'm gonna point out the obvious here. Uh, both men, first one, a lusty black man, second one, a black man. So come on, there's no ambiguity there. And again, you know, realize that in this article, it would say if these people were, if these men were unusual, uh, unusual to have black men in England and the military uh, born in these counties. It doesn't say any of that because it wasn't uncommon. It was normal. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next source and that is coming from the London Gazette dated July 19th, 1694, page one. All right, so it goes on to read, John Greenwood, Marine, born in Yorkshire, lived lately at Wisbeck and Kingsland, a tall, lean black man, ruddy complexion, age about 26, short black periwig, cinnamon colored jacket with small golden buttons and red plush breeches, striped with black and mixed colored stockings, broke out of the great Yarmouth goal in which he was committed for high treason. Whoever secures him and gives notice to the jailer of great Yarmouth shall have 10 guineas reward. All right, so let's dissect this very quickly here. As the article says, John Greenwood was a Marine. He's described as being a tall, lean black man with a ruddy complexion. So we talked about what ruddy looked like. It's like a light brown with a red undertone to it. And the article also says that he broke out of the great uh, Yarmouth goal, which was um, one of the oldest, right now is one of the oldest jails in the UK and apparently he committed high treason. So yeah, he's in a little bit of trouble. However, the main point again of this article and all these articles is this man is a black man and it says that he's a black man. All right, so we're moving on to our fifth source here. And this comes from the Dublin Journal dated July 28th in the year 1733. And this is from page two. All right, and this one goes on to read, deserted the 14th instant from his quarters at Charles Fort. Robert Havington of the Honorable Brigadier Molly's Regiment of Foot and in Captain Pepper's company, lively, comely black man with short black hair, full limbed and about six foot, one inch high, was bred a comber, but of late has followed beaking. He is very well known in Dublin for making fine cakes for tea 
and lived at the sign of the Peel in Capel Street, where his wife continues still. Whoever secures the said deserter and gives notice to the commanding officer at Charles Fort or to Captain Johnston, agent in Dublin, shall receive 40 shilling reward. Okay, so looking at this article really quick, uh, Robert Havington is a deserter and he is listed as a lively, comely black man with short black hair. And it also talks about his wife and that he is well known in Dublin, Ireland, of course, for making fine cakes for tea. All right, so let's move on to this next black man. And this source comes from the uh, Daily Advisor dated October 21st in the year 1748 from page two. Unfortunately, some of these articles are a little difficult to read just because they're so old and just the way that they were scanned. All right, so this article goes on to read, Samuel Davies was born in Wrexham, served his apprenticeship in Liverpool, well known at Tame in Oxfordshire, and kept a butcher shop for some years in German Street, St. James. He is a black man about five feet something inches high, has a downcast look. He had on, at the time he absconded, an old white wig, a fustian frock with plate buttons, a blue and white striped waistcoat, black breeches, light colored stockings with large silver buckles on his shoes and is about 50 years of age. All right, so real quick, uh, Samuel Davies was a butcher because it says he kept a butcher shop for some years. And it also said, of course, he's a black man and apparently well-dressed. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next source. And this one comes from the London Evening Post dated November 11th in the year 1718, page four. All right, so this one goes on to read, on Friday the 13th of June last, went from his friends in Sudbury, Suffolk, a tall, thin, black man, out of order in his head, about 25 years of age, with a light-colored coat, an old brown wig, black waistcoat, and breeches. Whoever knows of him are requested to take care of him and to use him very kindly. And if they can give notice of him, so as he may be found by Mr. Abraham Howard in Sudbury, aforementioned, or to Mr. James Brown in Gunpowder Alley, Crush Friars, London, shall be thankfully paid their charge and trouble, and also five guineas for a reward. All right, so real quick, let's dissect this article. And apparently this man, uh, this black man, as it says, is out of his head or out of order in his head. And uh, I guess his friends are looking for him. So it's kind of like a typical, you know, missing report in any city newspaper. All right, well, we're on to our next source of information, and this one comes from the London Daily Advisor, dated December 18th in the year 1746, page two. All right, so this one goes on to read, whereas a black man, 40 years of age, five feet and an inch high, disfigured with smallpox, has large eyebrows, a small, something, I can't read what it says, on the right side of his face, small hands and feet, does not wear his hair and is by trade a gardener. Rob James Sunders of Rickman's Worth in something shire of 50 shillings and a large old fashioned silver watch. Whoever gives notice of the man shall have a guinea reward and reasonable charge or half a guinea for the watch. All right, so looking at this really short ad, of course it starts off with saying that this man was a black man and by trade a gardener and apparently a uh, thief. All right, so moving on to the next piece of evidence here, and this comes from the London Gazette dated December 2nd in the year 1708 from page two. And this one goes on to read, deserted from the Honorable Brigadier Tatton's company in the 1st Regiment of Foot Guards, Robert Shales, born in North Britain, a well-set black man, about 36 years of age, five foot nine inches high, wears a black wig and a plain scarlet coat. If any persons harbor or conceal the said deserter, 
they shall be prosecuted according a something act of parliament made in that behalf. All right, so looking at this article really quickly, uh, this was another soldier that deserted his um, regiment. And of course, it says that he is a well-set black man. And apparently, if he's caught, he's going to be prosecuted according to some act of parliament. Okay, so we're moving on to our 10th source of information here. And this comes from the London Evening Post, dated August 12th, in the year 1736, page 3. Okay, and so this one goes on to read, Whereas one Descaliers, a little black man, who lately taught the Dutch and French tongues at Portsmouth, did, on Sunday the 25th of July, hire a mayor of Robert Grigg, grocer in Portsmouth, in order, as he pretended, to go to Wildley House, about four miles from the place, and the said Descaliers, not having since returned the said mare, and having been seen upon her the next day riding towards London. Whoever can give any account of the said mare, so that the owner may have her again, shall have half a guinea reward and reasonable charges on applying to Miss Lee and Picks, haberdashers in Southwark, or to Robert Grigg in Portsmouth, as aforesaid, the mare is a bay with a white stripe down her face, marked on one ear, four white feet, white under her belly, sinew strained in her forefeet, and lamish behind. She is about 14 hands and one inch high, and had on a yellow saddle cloth. All right, so looking at this article really quick, of course, it starts off saying that he's a little black man, and apparently he taught Dutch and French language. Um, and basically he took a horse and didn't return it. So they're looking for him. All right, so we're moving on again to uh, the next piece of evidence. And this one comes from the uh, London Evening Post dated July 31st in the year 1718, page three. All right, so this one goes on to read, whereas there was a person came to me, Richard Smith of Undle in the county of Northampton and gave his name, John Jeffries and also bargained for several parcels of wool. Some time after the said wool was delivered, the said person did not answer the several promises made according to the custom and trade. I went to Calne in Wiltshire, where I found the person's right name to be John Essex. He is a middle-sized black man, has an impotent look of which I thought it my duty to acquaint the world, and I hoped in time to make him a public example having received a great deal of damage by his false and lying insinuations. There is now in my custody being sent back with part of my wool from Northampton, a pack of Niles and neck wool. Whoever claims the same, giving me sufficient security, may have it readily delivered by Richard Smith of Undle. All right, so I'm gonna dissect this article really quick. And of course, uh, this man, John Essex, apparently stole some wool and he is listed as a middle-sized black man. And apparently, this author of this, uh, this article is very pissed and wants his wool back. And uh, <laughs> definitely goes in hard on uh, Mr. Essex here, writing that he has an impotent look and you know wishes to make him a public example. All right, so moving on to the next one, and just to let you know, I have about 17 sources that we're going to cover, so this is number 12. And as I mentioned before, you know, there are a lot more, but I figured 17 would be a good uh, sample. Okay, so this source of information comes from the Dublin Intelligence, and it's dated May 9th in the year 1710, page 2. All right, so this one goes on to read, Deserted the third instant May from Captain Addison's company of the Honorable Sir John Whiterong's regiment. William something alias Bennett, a tall black man, five foot eight inches high, with his regimental clothes, formerly a schoolmaster in Dublin. Also John Murphy, who deserted from the same company the 27th of April with his regimental clothes, with a sum of money he is five foot eight inches high, 26 years of age, a light brown wig, born in Wicklow, 
by profession a tailor, he has a something look, and the holy leaves in perfection. Whoever shall discover or give notice to Mr. Kettleby Gaw at the Royal Standard near the barracks, Dublin, so that they may be taken, shall have two guineas reward for each, or if they will be surrendered themselves to Mr. Gaw, or return to their quarters at Bryan's Bridge within fourteen days from the publication, something they shall be pardoned and kindly received. All right, so looking at this article, again, these are two um, soldiers that deserted their company or regiment, and um, the first one there, William Bennett, is listed as a tall black man and uh, formerly a schoolmaster in Dublin. And then the second guy, John Murphy, uh, doesn't really mention his complexion, but it does mention Dublin, so they're in Ireland. And lastly, you know, if William Bennett was a schoolmaster, he's pretty well educated. All right, so moving on to my next source here, and this one is from the Dublin Intelligence, and it's dated July 18th in the year 1704 on page two. All right, so this one goes on to read, advertisement, deserted from Captain Peter Martin's company of the Right Honorable, the Bard of Dungal's Regiment of Foot, uh, Abraham Kerr, a middle-sized man, brown complexion, short brown hair, gray clothes, and leathern breeches an Englishman born, about 30 or 32 years of age, John Miller, a tall black man, lank black hair, some of the smallpox in his face, born in the north of Ireland near Charrick, Fergus, age 27 years, John Cook, a tall slender man, black hair, a little curling, born in the Bithoprick of Durham in England, and an absolute stranger in this kingdom. He is remarkable by his right leg being formally broken. Whoever shall apprehend any or all of the above mentioned deserters and deliver them, any of them, to the said Captain Peter Martin at the camp at Bennett's Bridge near Kilkenny shall have six pounds reward for each of them. All right, so in breaking this down really quick, um, again, these are soldiers that deserted their uh, regiment. And the first one there, Adam, I'm sorry, Abraham Kerr, is listed as a middle-sized brown complexion uh, man. A brown complexion, of course, signifies a person of color, AKA black man. And uh, the second one, John Miller, he's listed as a tall black man with lank hair. And um, he is from the north of Ireland near Carrick Fergus, wherever that is. And the third one there, John Cook, he is uh, listed as a tall slender man, black hair, a little curling, so we don't know what his complexion is. And lastly, this is obviously the Dublin Intelligence newspaper, and they're mentioned in the city of Kilkenny, so obviously it's Ireland. All right, so this is the 14th source that I have here, and this source comes from the London Evening Post, dated November 22nd in the year 1743, page three. All right, so this one goes on to read, whereas a promissory note of hand given by one Mr. Paul Crispin to Mr. Gabriel de Gores, or order for 100, and I think that's the money symbol for guinea or pound, payable the 15th of February next, and endorsed by the above, de Gores and Anne Catherine Pironet was left in the hands of one M period S period, a Jew. He is something to return the same, and shall be well rewarded for so doing. Otherwise, his name will be inserted at full length. If any person has discounted the said note by applying to the mistress of the Muse Coffee House charging cross, they may hear further, or if offered to be discounted, you are something to secure the person and note, and give notice to the mistress of the Muse Coffee House above mentioned, and you shall have five guineas reward and reasonable charges. N period, B period, the Jew is a middle-sized black man, much pitted with smallpox. All right, so this article advertisement basically gives us some, uh, some interesting information. Basically, this note in question was put in the hands of a uh, one M period, S period, a Jew, as it says here. And apparently it was not returned to the rightful owner. So this person is willing to offer quite a bit of money to get that note back. Uh, or the person, or both. Uh, the interesting part of this one is, uh, of course, that 
this individual that's being looked for is a middle-sized black man. But what's more interesting is that he is a Jew and that doesn't seem weird to whoever's looking for him or the person that the editor of the paper. So that tells me there were black Jews in England. All right, so this is nothing new to me. It might be new to you, but I will be doing a video on black Jews, um, hopefully in the not too distant future. All right, so moving on, this is source number 15. And this source comes from the uh, London Evening Post dated November 30th in the year 1723, page three. And this one starts off reading right away on Wednesday morning, 27th of November with 10, looks like pounds or guinea, from John Vernon of Latton to Herefordshire. His servant man, John Watkins, a black man with short curled hair, fresh color and slender, middle-sized on a, looks like sorrel horse with a white face, one white foot behind and a wriggle with one stone, 13 hands, and an inch high. Whoever secures the said man, so as he may be brought to justice, shall have two guineas reward paid by the above said John Vernon at his house in Windmill Street, St. James. All right, so let's look at this one real quickly. And um, this uh, gentleman, John Watkins, is referred to as a servant man. So he must be an indentured servant to John Vernon. He is also listed uh, as a black man with short curled hair and fresh color. And when you see that fresh color, that must mean that he's a very light skinned black man, but he's still considered a black man. All right, so we're getting close to the end of the sources here, and this is number 16 of 17. And this one comes from the Dublin Gazette, dated November 11th in the year 1707, page two. All right, so this one goes on to read, deserted out of the Honorable Colonel Price's regiment in Captain White's company, Dennis Reynolds, five foot six inches high, a well-set black man, Pock Fretton, lived at Castle Blonny, Richard Condon, five foot seven inches high, well-set, smooth-faced, and curled black hair, Thomas Beaumont, a tailor, tall, pale-faced, lank brown hair, five foot seven inches high, James Johnson, a tinker, known by the name of, looks like McShane, Charles Byrne, a tall, slender young man, lank, light brown hair, Michael Lyon, or McLeon, a short young man, a tailor, lank brown hair, born about Kilbegin. If anyone apprehends either of them and gives notice to Mr. James Wills at the Treasury Office, Dublin, or to Captain White at Limerick, shall have 40 shilling each, or if they will return to their colors and make satisfaction for what they carry away, they shall be discharged if they desire. All right, so looking at this one very quickly, uh, the only one we really care, or I really care about is uh, Dennis Reynolds, and that's because he's uh, listed as a well-set black man. The rest of the soldiers here are probably not black men. And since we're talking about the Dublin Gazette here, and they're talking about the Treasury Office in Dublin, uh, it occurs to me that obviously this is in Ireland. All right, so we are down to the last source. This is number 17. And this source comes from the London Gazette, dated April 8th in the year 1708, page 10. All right, so this article goes on to read, whereas there is lately deserted from Captain John Forrester of the Honorable Richard Temple's Bar Regiment of Foot, one Peter Snee, aged about 24 years, a tall black man, wearing his own hair, round visaged, five foot seven inches high, lived with his father, one Peter Snee, over against the Seven Stars in Wheeler's Street in Spitalfields. Robert Harris, a tall black man, long visaged, wearing his own hair, by trade a sugar boiler, aged about 22 years, about five foot six inches and a half, also one Ralph Nichols, a lusty square well-set man, wearing his own hair, light and short, by trade a stocking weaver, but lately played as a porter, both living in Goodman's Fields. Whoever shall secure any or either of those persons, so as they may be delivered to Mr. Thomas Murphy, Marshall, at his house in Savoy, so as they may be secured for the said captain, shall receive from the said Mr. Murphy two guineas for each man and reasonable charges. All right, so in dissecting this article, we can see the two soldiers, Peter Snee, who's listed as a tall black man, 
wearing his own hair. And we also see Robert Harris, who is a tall, also listed as a tall black man, also wearing his own hair. And the third soldier there uh, is probably not a black man. All right, so I have many more examples of black men in Europe. But as usual, I won't be able to show them all because this video will be super long. I just wanted to prove that black men and obviously black women, although they don't get mentioned as often with their descriptions, are native to Europe. Now, I believe that I've already mentioned this. However, there is no room for ambiguity here. A black man is a black man. And these soldiers and regular citizens that I read to you about uh, were born and raised in Ireland, Scotland, and England. Full stop. So, as I revealed in my other videos, when I show you a man that is labeled as swarthy in complexion, or brown, or olive, or any other color on the complexion scale other than pale, florid, fair, fresh, those are men and women or children of color. They are not Africans visiting, or travelers, or merchants. These are indigenous Europeans of color. Furthermore, when I mention historical Europeans with names like Olaf the Black, the Black Douglas, the Black Prince, Black Dick, Donald the Black, the Black Finches, or Black Boy, as in Charles II's nickname given to him by his mother, that is because all of these people are dark complexioned people of color. Remember, people come in all colors, but when your nickname includes Black so-and-so, you are most likely very dark complexioned. Also, please realize they are not being called, for example, Olaf the Brown, or the Brown Douglas. They actually have the adjective black assigned to their name. Now don't misunderstand. There are plenty of brown complexion people as well. You know, it's my guess that brown complexion Europeans were the norm. So just like in our society today, if someone is exceptionally dark complexion, uh, where they seem almost black, then it would stand to reason that they would be given a nickname commensurate with that appearance. All right, so there's one last issue I wanna to touch on. Hopefully many of you saw my video called European men of color that fought in the American Revolution and beyond. In that video, I discussed the vast number of soldiers of color that fought in various wars. Now, I hope you realize the sheer scope of what I'm asserting. Soldiers of color have fought in all wars and in vast numbers. Also, I want you to realize, and again, this may be redundant, if someone in history is mentioned and their complexion is not listed, they very well may be a person of color. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this video and have a deeper understanding of the real history that has been stolen from us all, regardless of complexion. I have some real interesting videos in the works, so please stay tuned. And please, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can continue to get the straight up truth.